Okay, well, I, I, I just want to start with the obvious issue of this uh, year, of the last year, about the death of cities has been much exaggerated. Um, and that uh, you feel, as I do, that cities not only are going to bounce back, but are bouncing back. And say more about that. Yeah, I think there's no doubt. I mean, you know, it, it's interesting. Having been an urbanist for 40 years, um, I never once considered the role of pandemics or infectious disease in the form and function of cities. So that's kind of telling me something, you know, it, and I studied uh, urbanism as an undergraduate in planning as a minor at Rutgers, took a PhD in city planning at Columbia, you know, did all this research. And, and you know, I read things like, well, after bouts with tuberculosis or cholera, New York created uh, new building regulations for light shafts, but that was it. Uh, and then once this pandemic struck, you know, I, I had the opportunity uh, to actually go back and try to do research and read a lot of the histories of cities and pandemics. And, you know, what I could tell is that over the long course of urbanization, pandemics have not made much of a dent in the arc of urbanization. You know, talking to our friend Ed Glazer, Ed said you have to go back to like thousands of years before Christ mm -hmm. to, to find one instance of a city becoming derailed by infectious disease. You know, in the, in the plagues in Europe, 30 or 40 or 50 percent of the population of Italian cities was annihilated, yet those cities rebounded. Yeah. Think about London, your, your own London, its, its resilience in the wake of fires. Well, think about London in the, in the wake of bombings, never mind pestilence. Think about, here's another one, Berlin, you know, uh, resiliency. So I, I think that, you know, this has been overdrawn, heat of the moment. I think both in both of our countries, to be honest, there is a long tradition of anti-urbanism and anti-city yeah. feeling, particularly uh, against New York and London. So no, I have no doubt uh, that cities will bounce back. You know, they'll probably one, change one of, a bit, they, but I have no doubt that they'll bounce back. Okay. I think the other thing you've been identifying for a number of years is certain trends which are happening at the macro level and the micro level. And I'm, you know, it's for someone who I, I've worked probably more uh, in terms of with big cities, big and massive cities from the Mumbai's to uh, to um, Mexico City, whatever. You're identifying trends both across cities and from one city to another and within cities, which I find interesting. And that picks up also a sort of middle-sized scale. Yeah, so I'm, I'm more of an expert in cities in the advanced world and particularly in the United States. So I come with my own bias. Um, but it, it's, it's pretty clear to me that what this pandemic is doing is not disrupting urbanization. It's, it, it is really accelerating, as you said, trends already underway. Um, I think that that big cities like London and New York, uh, super cities, will do just fine. I do think they may get younger. You know, I, I think yeah. that people our age and people with families may decide, particularly in the United States, where educational options in urban areas are not as good, to, to leave cities for suburbs or for second cities. But that's something that's been going on in the United States for 50 years. Far less the case in Toronto, where I'm a professor, because urban schools are much better. Um, I think that certain second cities, I, you know, the way I kind of say when they talk about the so-called rise of the rest here, there's a fellow named Steve Case. He founded a high-tech company named AOL. He talks about the rise of the rest. He's very passionate. Mm -hmm. It's not the rise of everywhere else. I think there's probably a dozen cities, you know, Nashville, Pittsburgh, Denver, Austin. And now, you know, I spent part of the winter in Miami. This has been very interesting to watch. Yeah. Miami has been undergoing something of a moment. And, and you think about it, Miami and Austin are the two that you, you see a lot of press on in the United States. Well, Austin has been a tech hub since I started as a professor 40 years ago. 40 years ago, Austin's uh, business leadership and civic leadership was pilgrimaging to Silicon Valley to recruit talent and technology. And when I wrote Rise of the Creative Class, Rick, in the late 1990s, Austin was the number one preferred destination of Carnegie Mellon top engineers, electrical engineers and computer engineers. Miami, of course, is different. People confuse it as a tech hub, but many people have long called Miami the sixth borough of New York because of the snowbird phenomenon. But it's not just that. Finance people and real estate people in New York have long had a position in Miami, along with Miami being the, the banking center for Latin America. So I don't think it makes, it's not a great change to see, you know, hedge fund types, investment bank type, real estate types, 
in the United States saying one, it's warm and it's nice and I have access to a beach, but two, because of our peculiar state and local tax structure, right? Mm -hmm. Which says uh, you, you can pay a different state and local tax and since Florida has none, uh, very wealthy people are taking advantage of it. But I don't think we're gonna see a massive change in geography. It'll be kind of subtle shifts and, and a handful or two of new places may rise, but they're not going to displace New York and Los Angeles and San Francisco. They'll just be well, a new group of second cities. The, the point you've been making that there are push and pull factors um, and technology, of course, today, um, because of the pandemic and because of the remote working um, uh, focus, you know, which is pretty impressive the, the way that's happened. But you've been noting that there's been a trend that way. And can you describe the push and pull dimension? Yeah, I think, I think as we know, you know, folks who work in our field, there are two sets of forces that work on urban areas. There are push forces which push people towards urban centers and towards the downtown core, and there are pull factors which pull them away. And I think both are at work. You know, what we've seen in the press is there, a big emphasis on the pull factors. Well, the people being pulled out of London or New York tend to be older, yeah. tend to be more affluent, tend to have families, and, and perhaps they want a yard. And the one, one way I've tried to say this is it has accelerated family formation moves. People who were likely to leave London and New York as they had more kids and their families got bigger and they wanted more space. Moves that would have taken place over a year or two years, three years, five years got compressed into three months. But there's also push factors. And those push factors have been going on for the past decade, particularly young and ambitious people back to cities. But that's not just over the past decade. If you look at the wake of any previous pandemic, uh, going back to the plagues in Europe, the cholera epidemics, the Spanish flu, they've always been followed by a massive movement of young people into cities because cities have opportunity, they pay higher wages, but they're also great places to kind of make a life. And, and so that's what I tend to see is going to happen. I actually think, this may sound crazy, that, that the pandemic may make London and New York and San Francisco better. You know, you, you were very kind to host a book event for me on my book, The New Urban Crisis mm -hmm. at the LSE. And I was talking about the of housing affordability and hyper gentrification and aristocratization and you know we could go on and on oligarchification mm -hmm. inequality, you know now there's an opportunity for London and New York and San Francisco to have their housing prices reset. Maybe as many of these oligarchs don't want to come or the, the super affluent decide they want an estate somewhere in the country, Monaco, whatever they want to go, and and younger people and more creative people, artists and musicians can come back to cities. So I'm actually hopeful instead of the end of cities that we'll see kind of a renaissance of a creative, if I will, may poking fun at myself, a cre more creative, more artistic city. That's my hope. I'm not saying it has to go that way, but there's an opportunity for I, it. I, I love the phrase you've used of um, that, you know, that the cities in the end have thick labor and mating markets. And I, <laughs> I think that's the, I think in this case, it's probably going to be the mating markets. Yeah. I, I, you had mentioned remote work. I think remote work is a big deal. And, uh, you know, if we look at the benchmarks, about 5% of people in advanced countries worked remotely before the pandemic. The argument is it'll settle out about 20% of workforce. Mm. Well, you know, that's going to put a, that's going to change cities. And I think most people who read the press are focused on where we live, the geography of where we live. I actually think it's the geography of work that will change more. And I do think the central business districts of big cities are going to be have a big challenge. The, the analog I would use for this is deindustrialization. Now, now, I don't think this is going to be as big as deindustrialization, but it's an analog that when, when the factories began to move out of London and New York and Soho or Tribeca or Chelsea, whatever neighborhoods we pick, and they began to be remade into then artist complexes and then high tech office complexes and shopping areas and something like that's going to happen. And I think it's not that the central business district is going to disappear. I think there's just going to be somewhat less demand for office space. So then we, I think we could and you're an architect, right? You, you, no, you actually work on the design of cities. I think the real challenge is how do we make those better neighborhoods? I think we can make them more live work neighborhoods or the phrase urbanists like to use 15 minute neighborhoods. Well, 15 minutes. You know, how do we add working and living together in those communities? And, I, and that could be for the better. Yeah, I was going to add that I think apart from the, the resilience of the city itself as a, as a mechanism, as a social economic mechanism, the built form itself plays a role in that. In other words, if you have big fat buildings designed only for banking halls a la 80s right you're sort of you've had it you can't you can't turn it into a funky studio space for young couples to uh, 
live in. So this the, the actual building size, and this is where climate change, interestingly, mm -hmm. or the attention to climate change is going in the right way. It's a win-win situation. Basically, thinner buildings, opening windows, not depending on air conditioning and all that. That means that, you know, what was going to be a lawyer's office in the CBD of London or Canary Wharf or whatever can easily become a, a place. So I think that is an, an important, important part. And I think I'm some also... buildings will have to come down. I mean, I mean, the same thing happened with old factory buildings. Some of them were reused magnificently and others were, were white elephants. But, but yeah, the, the, the space will be valuable. Because, you know, that's what's so interesting about the history of cities. The space remains valuable, but the use of that space changes over time. And once again, it'll change. You know, the, for, for me, the great model, then we'll move on, is the Georgian house, right, in London, the white terraced stuccoed house, which is the cheapest building in the world because it's, it's all brick and you just put some nice looking stuff at the front, right? And all across London, they, you know, they were built for the emerging middle classes of the 1830s. Uh, then quite a lot of them turned into multi-level flats um, occupied by students or whatever, you know, down and out. And now exactly those same houses have been bought up by the oligarchs. You know, so the society has changed, but the building form has remained. I actually think London, despite all of the troubles with Brexit in the United States, in New York, all the troubles with Trump, London and New York are going to remain the two most important cities in the world for the rest of my life. What's interesting to me is the city people don't talk about as much, Hong Kong. I think Hong Kong is the one that's in deep trouble, you know, given all the political troubles with China. But it's, it's, it's not going to be, I don't see any city, maybe I'm crazy, uh, displacing New York or London as, as, as dominant super cities for the world in the course of my life, maybe in my children's life, but that's another story. So on, on the, uh, let's call it vibrancy and uh, ability to respond and attract of these big cities, right? I, I live in, in North London, so near this massive new development uh, called King's Cross, which you probably have visited when you were here last. We didn't go together, but... And the, the biggest single building as part of this actually old refurbished neighborhood, which is very funky, uh, is the new Google headquarters. So it couldn't be more central, right? It just... Uh, and the reason it moved there is mainly because it's next to two railway stations and a funky art university. Mm -hmm. right? That's the... Now I've observed in New York, in fact, I was involved in advising the, the big developers there as it happened a few years ago, uh, Vornado, the Penn Plaza development, that if I'm right, there's, there's, there's um, Apple, there's Google, and I think Facebook are also moving into the city into and, and occupying large amounts of uh, of office space there. Did you expect that? Um, I, I actually did. You know, I wrote about this in Rise of the Creative Class and was roundly criticized and used the example of then Amazon colonizing the city of Seattle. Obviously, they took it way too far. But when I wrote about it, people said I was crazy to anticipate it. Not that it would become gentrification. It was just the obvious that, that it couldn't scale. Um, I actually think that London and New York are going to change at the margin. So I want to make that clear that what is going to leave London and New York are real estate and financial operations. And they're not they're still going to be among, if not the largest real estate and financial centers in the world. But some of them will leave. What's coming to London and New York is high technology, the Googles, the Amazons, the Facebooks and and also startups in this space. And the reason is because that young high technology talent really wants to be in big cities. Not all of it. Some of that talent likes to be in Austin or San Francisco, but a considerable mass of it. And, you know, my dad, you know, I talk a lot about my dad with the seventh grade education working in a factory. And my dad always said, if, if you want to get engineers to work in the factory, you have to hire the new ones. I go, dad, what do you mean by that? He said, well, engineering skills decline very quickly. Yeah. So if you don't hire a new engineer, the, the old engineer goes out of style really fast, Rich. He oh. had a number, I forget if it was five or 10 years. So these companies need young engineers, right? They need young computer scientists, young AI people. Those people are the people who are attracted to London and Europe and, and other cities and New York and the United States. So I actually think the city, the big cities becomes at the margin more tech, less finance and less real estate. Now, it'll still probably be more finance than tech, but I think the balance is going to shift. I mean, obviously one of the arguments behind what you're describing is that location matters. You know, to, to, for, let, let's call it a factory or anyway, a 21st century version of uh, 
um, a factory uh, which uses based on knowledge work uh, and, and technology um, in, in the past would have been very, very dependent on uh, locating themselves next to the ideal workforce, work pool, right? So I think this is very interesting because I think all of this is partially correct and none of it is completely correct. So people tend to think concentration versus distribution. The world is flat or the world is spiky. And the reality is it's all of those things and more. Um, I think for young talent, engineering talent, technical talent, ambitious talent, that talent, because of what you said before, a thick labor market and a thick mating market, will locate around the world in big cities. That it will that those folks will just be more attracted to big cities than ever before, and and so even as the world becomes flatter or more spread out, that talent those talent pools will be more concentrated. Now, you may be able to tap into that talent pool in London, in New York, in Singapore, and their equivalents, uh, but it's not going to spread out evenly. I think remote work enables older people um, mm -hmm. who have families, who want more space to say, look, I'll use my dad as an example again, who worked in a factory. My dad had two kids and a wife and my mom and my brother and me, and they needed more space. They were running out of space in their apartment in Newark. So they bought a single family home in a nearby suburb of Newark called North Arlington, mm -hmm. where we were raised. Well, now a young family can say, I don't have to go to a nearby suburb of London and commute to the factory. I can use Zoom, just like we're talking now. I can go, and I know the United States better than I know England, but, but you, you, I could say, well, I could go to Nashville. I could go to Pittsburgh. I could go to Miami. I could go to Indianapolis. I could go to the Hudson River Valley. Um, I have more choices than the suburbs. So I think what's, what's actually happening is that the people who prefer cities will stay in cities but instead of the people who prefer not city going to the adjacent suburb, they can spread out more. And they have a bigger portfolio of choices than just the local suburb. And I think the beneficiary areas of that will be uh, rural places that are wonderful. And I bet this is going on outside of London. I don't know what it, but wonderful rural places outside of New York and San Francisco and London, where you can live in a spectacular estate at a fraction of the cost. And then the other thing would be second cities which have sufficient amenity, uh, but a big cost differential with London and New York, where, where if you leave the, those cities and go to that second city, for a fraction of the cost, you can have a wonderful life. And, and I think what's also happened, the amenity differential that we would have seen 20 years ago in London or New York or San Francisco or Paris, where you stuff you could get there, you couldn't get anywhere else. That stuff's available in second cities now. You know, there are great cafes, there are great restaurants. You can shop, you can shop online. You know, you don't have to go to the boutique down the road. So I think the amenity differential between big cities and smaller places has become equalized. So for those older people with families who want more space, they can get it and doesn't have to be in the nearby suburb. Yeah, it would be a sad thing for two uh, people with Italian connections. Uh, in my case, 50% in your case, 100%, right? 100%. Both friends, yeah. Um, to think that the process you're describing could end up uh, with cities without families and young children. And I think that's, that's, that, that's a potential danger. I think that's the United States case. I, I, I think that's less the case in Canada or Europe. And I think, I always want to qualify this. The difference in the United States is that urban schools are terrible. And, and there is it's better than it was, but there's a degree of violence that there just isn't in Toronto. I mean, in Toronto, they might steal your car or they might, you know, somebody might break into your window and take your money clip, but you're never in fear for your life. I think in the United States with, with the proliferation of firearms, th that's part of it. But I also think the schools, I, you know, almost everyone I talk to who, who's raising kids in the United States says, you know, the urban schools are, the public schools are not great. Uh, they're better, but they're not great. And then if they want to choose a private school, they're driving anywhere from 45 minutes to an hour each way. That's just not the case in the United Kingdom or Canada. In, in our street in Toronto, in our neighborhood in Toronto, there are probably five or six schools within walking distance, you know, several public schools, a Catholic school, private schools, and people mix and match according to their needs. That's the difference in the United States. I think the United States does become mm 
it's always been less families, but I think right now we're looking at the United States where that, the cities that, could become clear, even more devoid of families, that's a clear which is tragic. Business. And I think the same is true of Canada. Kids walk to school in a way that just doesn't happen. So I think the states is, they talk about American exceptionalism. I think this is a real area of American exceptionalism mm -hmm. is that you know, the, the cities are very hard for families to make a go. And I think the, the United States is that exception. And it's kind of, that's kind of sad. Actually, you and I haven't talked a lot about the role of governance. I mean, obviously the more I spend time with the work at LSE cities and looking at different uh, systems of governance, you know, one, there is no doubt that having someone in charge <laughs> of an area where people tend to live, tend to work and pay taxes is a pretty good model, right? And um, uh, I mean, you've made your point about the 1% moving to across state boundaries and because the taxation system is different. And I have become quite positive in the view that you can change things. I mean, in my city, uh, exactly 20 years ago, well, now 20 in one month, we didn't have anyone in charge and we invented a new system. And whatever we think of the three individuals who've been mayors, having a mayor has been positive. And... Um, a mayor responsible for the transit authority, a mayor responsible for economic development, um, emergency services, sadly, not the schools, interestingly, that's yep. still run by federal government. How, what's your feeling, the more, I mean, because in the States, it's very checkered, isn't it? The, the, even the power of the mayor is very different. So City this, City. I think, is the biggest challenge of the 21st century, bar none. I think that the, the Industrial Revolution gave us centralized power structures. And I, I cut my teeth studying factories, not studying cities. So you saw this in factories. And then the people who ran Japanese factories, when they developed this competitive advantage, said, that's just stupid. We are going to decentralize decision-making authority down to the worker on the factory floor. But we've not done that in, in, in governance of advanced industrial or advanced knowledge-based nations. Uh, look at our own country. Look at the United States, if there's ever been a signal example of, if you ask me the biggest problem in the United States, it's the imperial presidency and the over-concentration of power in the executive branch. And Donald Trump exemplifies that because he's just incompetent and dysfunctional. You would much rather have a robust and resilient system that's decentralized, where there's multiple power centers at the state or provincial level, and then you know, subsidiarity. You wanna bring power down to the place closest to where those decisions make a difference. Look, I'm amazed that that conversation is so difficult to have. At least you have a conversation around city governance and metro mayors. And that's, that conversation has not been on the table. Maybe under Biden, it will be in the United States. But that's, I, I think the biggest issue facing us in the advanced world is the over-concentration of power at the executive branch. That means devolution and the empowerment of the local. What I do think the United States does well, and I'm going to give the United States one prop here, is the public-private partnership. Hmm. You know, this is something that the US is ingenious at, that I've not seen in Canada. You don't see as much in the UK and Europe. This mixing of philanthropic assets and private sector assets and civic ambition with local governance. Now, it's not, we have to work to make that better, but it's remarkable. And every city does it different. You know, if you go from New York to San Francisco to Indianapolis to Milwaukee, every partnership is different, but they all seem to work. Give me a couple of concrete examples. Well, look at Pittsburgh, you know, a city I lived in for 20 years, a city that was down on its knees. And it wasn't local government that took that, built that back or federal government. It was the Heinz Foundation and the Mellon Foundation and other foundations coming together with the universities, coming together with the business community and labor and saying, look, we have to bring our city back and government doesn't have money. So we're going to develop all of these hybrid institutions. You can't even figure out the names of them, public-private partnerships. And we're just gonna make a go of it. You know, We're going to fix our city and make it better. And the university is gonna do its part and the private sector is gonna do its part. It's, it's such a flexible and amorphous thing. It's hard to put names on it. And every, every place you go in the United States, this has happened in some way, shape or form. What one thing we call them are now anchor institutions, mm -hmm. like a Carnegie Mellon or University of Pittsburgh yeah. is an anchor institution. But I think putting real structure on that governance, local governance around public-private partnership, that's the big challenge. And I don't see enough work. I don't see enough thinking and work and action around that, but I think that's really the challenge. And by the way, where do we see an example of that working? The damn vaccine. You know, the damn vaccine, so, sorry, government has failed on so many things, but when you got the university working and AstraZeneca and Pfizer and Johnson and Johnson and Moderna, with this weird combination of philanthropy and state and local action, you know, it's kind of magnificent. 
and 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 so I think there's something in a new, less structured form of governance, which is more local and more a mixture of private, public, and philanthropic. That's our future. So if one were to um, look forward, and you know, you 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 you've been very good at also helping uh, a non-specialist audience understand the complexities of cities, right? How how they, how they work, and you know. I think I, I know because you've already mentioned it, you know, there are some winners and some losers ahead, right? And I think you've described the next years are going to be bumpy. They're going to be bumpy for everyone, but they're going to be bumpy for cities. So who are going to be the winners and who are going to be the losers? Well, you know, what, what keeps me up at night is the fact that the Spanish flu in the, in the late teens of the last century was followed by the Roaring Twenties. The Roaring Twenties were an era of great partying, uh, some cultural significance, some cultural movement in arts and, and music, but also tremendous, the Gilded Age, tremendous inequality, the Great Gatsby. You know, I think we're really looking at the roaring 2020s. That's what I think we're looking at. And we're looking at a time where people are going to emerge from this and say it was terrible. We want to forget it. Uh, they call the Spanish flu the forgotten pandemic. It wasn't talked about. Uh, I think people are going to want to forget it. And I'm worried that we're going to go into this rebound, if you will, and we're going to forget that there are losers as well as winners. We're going to celebrate the winners and that we're going to see more economic inequality, more spatial inequality, unless we galvanize ourselves to saying, look, out of, out of this, we want more inclusive and resilient cities. That's our job to make that case. But my, my hunch is we're going to look, I, I think if we have this conversation a year from now, we're going to be in a totally different space. And cities are going to be roaring back. Things are going to be kicking back into gear. People are going to be in a celebratory mode. Trump's going to be way gone. Sorry. Uh, you know, it's going to be a different world out there. And I just hope that we stay galvanized about dealing with these problems of inequity, of racial and economic injustice, of inclusivity. And then one you said, resiliency. Not, not all of those inequities, which are social and cultural and racial, but also that the issues of resiliency and climate change and all the other issues that are affecting our cities. I, I hope we stay focused on, but I'm worried we're gonna lose that focus. First of all, I, I love the idea that we're ending this conversation in a positive note with the idea of the roaring 2020s. It's a fantastic concept that uh, we, we <laughs> this, this sort of uh, positivism on your part needs to infect everyone who's listening, which it, it, it um, it, no, no, no doubt. And I, I think. You know, uh, it, I mean, I want to be really clear on this for folks listening in. This was a horror. This is a horrible pandemic. I mean, this is terrifyingly horrible. And and four hundred thousand Americans nearly have died. But if you look at how fast we invented a vaccine and how fast we're rolling out a vaccine, it's kind of, the scientific advance and innovation component. I'm not trying to be Pollyanna. Is pretty amazing, and I think an amazing step forward. I think we're gonna remember that a lot, that this was the era in which we began to not conquer viruses, but learn how to cope. We pulled off something as, as dysfunctional as our governments were, and as dysfunctional as Trump, things didn't have to be that way. We still pulled off something pretty amazing. I and think even some of the research you published in the last months, you know, do, does confirm that actually the dense, the nasty big dense city has actually been part of the solution and not just part the of the big part. And, and that was colleagues at LSE to some of your colleagues as well, doing some of that incredible work um, that showed that, that it was the connectivity, if you think about it, it was the global connectivity of London and New York that, and, and the ski slope areas of the Alps and of the, the Rockies that exposed them. Uh, and then it propagated through those communities. But if you look at how that virus, you know, looked for spaces to invade, it very quickly moved to smaller cities and in the United States devastated rural, because the United States was very ineffective at mitigating the virus. So it, it moved into the Dakotas and rural areas, which had high, much higher incidence of, of, of cases and deaths per capita. So yeah, and, and, and the big cities have been much better at mitigation. This is what surprises me. Um, that in fact, in the United States, which I know the best, we have seen a migration, at least a supposed migration, the state aren't all in, but from New York and San Francisco, the places that have both most effectively mitigated the virus, okay, the places that have taken a disaster situation and mitigated it the best, to the places that have done the worst, Florida and Texas. Mm -hmm. That just astounds me. And I know why people are saying, well, I want warmth, I want outside, I'm scared of inside. But it's very interesting that the migration in many ways has gone exactly the opposite 
of how you might have predicted. It's gone from safe, safer, increasingly safe to increasingly less safe places. So that also tells me is that the virus is not the main motivator of the migration. There are other things at work. Yeah, and I think just as a concluding reflection, going back to the beginning, the fact that cities, you know, <laughs> your point that you don't really think of cities that have died as a result of illness or 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 died full stop. I mean, cities tend to, tend to last even longer than national states uh, very often, right? They um, they certainly do. And I think this notion of you know the res the resilience word is used too much, and it means every it means it doesn't mean very much anymore. But there, there is something there that I think uh, you're just to put an end note on this, you know, if if I turn on my TV, you know, and I don't go out, I'm very safe. Uh, I haven't been into a store since March. I haven't I wasn't allowed in my office, still not allowed because we're locked down in Toronto. Um, but if I put on a show and it's showing London or New York. Like or Paris, I'm like dying to get back there and I'm not the only one. So I think what's happening now is people are scared. They can't go out. They want to be outside. Um, but as soon as things get safer, you know, I, you can't keep them down on the farm, right? I mean, it's a great old expression, but there's something in the appeal and energy of cities to human beings that's not going to go away. And people might think, you know, you've heard this all the time with your friends who have retired. Oh, you know, I moved to this wonderful part of a warm community and I started golfing and playing tennis. And that was great for six months. And then I was bored out of my freaking mind. <laughs> I think the same thing's going to happen. You know, people are going to go, there's a reason London and New York and Paris are great cities. And it's not because they have great golf courses and tennis courts and great weather. It's because they have great people and smart people and great places to interact. And I think it might take a while. It may not be a year. It might take two or three years. But we're going to see a powerful recoil towards, towards real cities like we always have. No, I think, I think the notion that the city uh, sort of generates randomness is of course part of its attraction. So uh, maybe that's what we're, we're we're thinking forward. That the you know the the bumpy ride is always going to be there, uh, but the sort of the, the the direction of travel is pretty clear, and and could be quite positive. You know, and I've enjoyed the sabbatical, and I've enjoyed the downtime as much as I've been scared. So, but I think a lot of us. Not many of us are going to want to stay in our remote work cubicles forever. I, I, and there's a reason great cities are great cities and they're hard to replicate. You know, it's, it's really hard to replicate what happens in London or Paris or New York or Tokyo. So, yeah. And, 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 you know, someone, there's a, there's a person, a writer in New York city called Jeremiah Moss. It's a, it's a pseudonym. Uh, and this writer writes about the old declining New York, great stuff, very critical, very left, brilliant, brilliant stuff. And uh, they interviewed uh, Jeremiah Moss. And, and Jeremiah said, maybe the great thing about this pandemic is that the people who never belonged in cities will get the hell out. Now, now I, I don't have the nerve to put it that way, but his point was, what you saw in a lot of in-migrants to London and New York and down at were people who didn't want, they wanted to be out of the city. We can come up with the example, but they literally were building these hermetically sealed buildings and hermetically sealed neighborhoods that were not urban. They were not what New York, and, and his point was, those people didn't belong in the city anyway. So if they leave, we're just left with the city people. And I think that's another point that's well worth taking, that cities went off in a direction that they were becoming very suburban, very affluent, very aristocratic, almost neo-feudal, right? To Joel Kotkin's phrase, neo-feudalism. You know, maybe this is a, a reset in that we go back to people who like artists and creatives and young people and people who love cities for what they are, for their funky, interactive, dense texture. And I just thought it was a remarkable comment he made and, that's an uh, and, and a smart one. And probably the follow on from that is that the most exciting thing is not to know who the next group of people we're going to mix with yeah, is. I think that's right. And I think the other thing that will happen post pandemic is one of the other reasons cities have died a little a little bit less so in, in the United Kingdom, but in the United States was Trump restricting immigration. So one of the things that has been fueled to the greatness of cities is this incredible global Im immigration. I think that will bounce back across the world that we'll see this, this new round of immigration as people say we want opportunity too. So yeah, I, you know, cities, hopefully cities become better cities. Well, we look forward, Richard, to the roaring 2020s in cities. So thank you for that.